We all know Trudeau's gun control agenda is based on fear and lies. But is there any truth behind his claims regarding this controversial issue? Let's have a look. Welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to be debunking more of Trudeau's gun control claims here in Canada. In our previous video, we showed that the handgun freeze is unconstitutional. Now, I don't mean unconstitutional in the I don't like what the government's doing to me kind of way. I mean unconstitutional in the based on Supreme Court precedent kind of way. And in that video, during our discussion of the Oaks test, we debunked the Liberals' primary claim that more guns means more gun crime. This evidence came directly from Statistics Canada. Not only does more guns not mean more crime, StatsCount also outright says in their 2024 article on firearm-related violent crime that the cause of gun violence is violence itself, not guns as the Liberals claim. According to StatsCan, gun crime is merely a symptom of violent crime, and they make no mention of it being the result of lawful gun ownership. So for Trudeau or anyone else to say otherwise is simply a manipulative lie. One of the most significant problems about the gun control conversation is that we're often talking about different stats. It's always our stats versus their stats, our arguments versus their arguments, our talking points versus their talking points. They will say things like, guns cause violence. And our side will often respond with something like, well, what about alcohol use and its relation to violence? And the end result of that is the conversation just goes nowhere. Not that these aren't valid concerns or even valid arguments. I mean, they absolutely are, and you're probably even right to bring them up. But when that happens, we're no longer having the same conversation. You basically just end up in a yelling contest with the other person. They're not going to abandon their viewpoint because you're not engaging it, and they won't hear anything you say because they have not been presented with any information to indicate that they're not right. And at that point, it's not even a debate or a conversation anymore. It's just two people making noise. So it's not enough to just claim that you're right or that your view is more accurate. What you should be doing is providing evidence that their beliefs are inaccurate or incomplete before you can really bring them to understand why they're wrong. Which is why I'm going to directly debunk Trudeau and the Liberals' gun control claims today. There are many videos out there proving why we are right, but there's actually not very many proving or showing why they are wrong. So I'm going to engage them on their turf and disprove most of their claims outright. Their overall approach and justification for the gun bans extends to well beyond just the gun crime debate. In my previous video on the unconstitutionality of the handgun freeze, I established their six concerns as it relates to firearm misuse. And these issues are firearm related violent crime, gender based violence, intimate partner violence, or IPVs, mental health, harm prevention, and MCI. And one thing to note here, I'm not actually going to discuss MCIs in this video as that's a pretty sensitive topic on YouTube. Not that I'm avoiding the conversation or anything. It's simply going to get its own dedicated video so that the algorithm doesn't torpedo this one. We've already provided enough evidence to debunk their claims of a correlation between lawful gun ownership and gun crime. So that's one out of the five down. So let's take a look at the remaining four. First up is gender-based firearm-related violence. This issue, along with intimate partner violence, is especially important to debunk. And this is because the Charter, under Section 1, allows the government to violate your rights provided they're doing it to protect the rights or safety of a vulnerable group, among other reasons. Women would certainly qualify as a vulnerable group. So if this is a problem which disproportionately affects women in a significant way, then we would have no valid way of establishing any real Charter defense against government overreach. And this is also why the government brings it up so frequently when defending their gun control measures. But as you're about to see, that claim really isn't all it's cracked up to be. Canadians are united in wanting more done to keep communities safe and prevent and gender-based violence. And that's exactly why we're here today. So they claim that they needed to implement C-21 and their other gun control measures in order to solve gender-based violence and to keep women safe. Let's take a look at the 2024 firearm-related crime article from Juristat to see what StatsCan thinks of this claim. So it says, unlike violent crimes in general, in which 53% of the victims were women, firearm-related violent crimes targeted mostly men in 2022, accounting for 66% of the victims. Men also accounted for approximately 8 in 10 victims who are actually injured by firearms. It then goes on to say, like for violent crimes in general, 89% of the accused for firearm-related violent crimes in 2022 were men. So according to Juristat, gun violence is primarily a man-on-man -man problem. Which, I mean, everybody knows that if they've spent even five minutes looking at the problem. Now, in theory, this could still qualify as gender-based violence since it disproportionately affects men, but men are not a vulnerable group in the eyes of the law. And, frankly, quite rightly so, if we're being honest about it. 
So if the claim is that we need to ban firearms to protect women since they are disproportionately affected by gun violence, that claim is radically untrue, even at a glance. But if the claim is that women are more vulnerable because they are less able to deal with firearm-related threats, that's also untrue, as women are certainly no less bulletproof than men are. However, gender-based violence is a term which is often used interchangeably with IPV. If we investigate instances of IPV specifically, then perhaps there actually is some truth to the matter. Now, for what it's worth, this is one area that, on its surface, might actually appear to be true if you don't try to understand or rationalize the numbers. For example, if we take a look at Juristat again, they have this to say. Women represent close to 9 in 10 victims of firearm-related crimes committed by an intimate partner. As we already discussed, men represent the majority of victims of firearm-related crime, accounting for about two-thirds or 66% of the victims in 2022. And that's a proportion that has remained relatively stable since 2009. However, this proportion greatly varied depending on the relationship of the accused to the victim. In particular, women represented 89% of the victims of violent crime involving firearms committed by a spouse or an intimate partner. So that sounds pretty absolute. If you turn off your brain and choose to not think about it at all, women are quite clearly disproportionately affected by firearm-related IPV. Right? Like, this is clearly black and white evidence to prove all of Trudeau's claims. Well, let's turn our brains back on for a second and think about it for a moment. Who do women date? Who are their intimate partners? Uh, generally speaking, their intimate partners are men. And what did I just say men do? Men are responsible for 89% of the firearm-related violence in Canada. That's the exact percentage of IPV suffered by women. This would indicate that women actually aren't disproportionately targeted by firearms, they're disproportionately targeted by men. And this perfect correlation indicates that this isn't a firearm-related problem in the slightest. Gun control of any kind does nothing to address this problem. The problem is men, not firearms. Now, of course, the problem isn't all men, or even most men, it's just that tiny sliver of asshats which are not representative of the whole. And not only that, but most people, even those who would consider themselves pretty familiar with the gun control conversation, they don't really know just how rare firearm-related IPV actually is. In 2020, StatScan says it accounted for merely 1% of all IPV. However, it also said that 2020 was an unusually high year, and it speculated that this was due to the entire country essentially being placed on house arrest. Which kind of even makes sense when you think about it. Everyone would, would have been trapped at home and just getting on each other's nerves. If we look at the previous year before that, which is also the most recent year which I can actually find this information that was reported, we can see that normally, firearm-related IPV usually accounts for much less than even 1% of the total. In this case, 660 out of about 85,000 incidents, which makes for a whopping 0.78% of the total problem. And this number was much closer to about half a percent back in 2011, according to this other Jurostat table. So not only are women not actually disproportionately affected by firearm-related IPV, it accounts for an unbelievably narrow portion of the very real problem that they do actually face. Even if Trudeau's gun control measures did somehow magically and completely fix the problem, which <laughs> there is no indication of any kind to suggest it actually would, it would still leave, quite literally, over 99% of the true problem completely unaddressed. And Trudeau has also frequently made this claim. One of every three girls and women killed by an abuser is murdered with a gun. And this is the last of their IPV claims. Now, I can't find that information anywhere to actually back up this claim. In 2020, Juristat said that IPV accounted for one in four female victims of firearm-related crime, but that's not homicide specifically. One could assume that maybe it would be slightly higher, but then in this Juristat article from 2023, it would indicate that over the past decade, it's actually been lower, not higher. According to a decades-long sample set from recent years in Canada, Firearms accounted for only 22.7% of all gender-related homicides for women and girls. However, it is worth noting that this stat isn't a perfect representation of the IPV claim, as it covers a slightly wider demographic than just IPV. However, IPV does actually make up the bulk of this category, so it really shouldn't be too far off either. So, more than likely, if there's any truth to this claim, it's a heavily curated claim. It's probably the result of some severely limited demographic, which has then been singled out in some particularly bad year, maybe even 2020 again for the same reasons as mentioned before. But even if it were true, and even if 33% of abused women are actually killed by guns, 
this is still actually quite a bit lower than the national average for all homicides, which is roughly 38 to 40 percent as indicated on this chart, meaning that women suffering from IPV are actually still statistically less likely, on average, to be the victims of gun homicides. And if you use the more correct number of 22.7% as observed over the last decade, then female victims of IPV are almost half as likely on average to be the victims of firearm homicide. So at the end of the day, no matter which way you slice it, if the claim is that women are somehow disproportionately affected by gun violence, it's just not statistically true here in Canada. And if someone like me can find these publicly available numbers so easily, then surely Trudeau and the Liberals would know about them as well. So not only do we know they are lying, but now we have shown that they should be able to use this faulty claim to get protection under Section 1 of the Charter. Up next is another category YouTube doesn't like us talking about, so I'm going to keep it really short and non-specific. However, this should still be pretty easy to follow along with, provided you can read between the lines even just, even just a little bit. I'll put links in the description down below if you want to read up on it and learn a little bit more. According to this article from Justice Canada, around 80% of firearm-related deaths are due to this phenomenon. If we look at the total numbers, however, it tells a slightly different story. Between 1970 and 1995, it was already going down pretty significantly, from 35.6% in 1970 all the way down to 27.8% in the mid-90s. However, this is obviously a pretty old data set which predates even the Firearms Act, and so far as I can tell, Justice Canada doesn't really have any more recent articles on the matter. And this external study regarding the recent years in Canada shows it's actually significantly lower than it used to be it now accounts for merely 16% of the total and only around 70% of firearm-related deaths. Now, I'm not going to go over this page in detail for obvious reasons, but its findings are plainly available at the very top in the highlights section. It says that while legislation may reduce this kind of firearms misuse, it does nothing to address the problem because people will simply use other means if firearms are not available. And that's not a one-off conclusion either. Our Justice Canada article from decades ago even agrees with this assessment. It says, the observed correlation between firearm availability and redacted in general is not as solid as some might expect. In Canada, provincial comparisons of firearm ownership levels and overall rates of redacted found that levels of firearm ownership had no correlation with regional redacted rates. Furthermore, the Canadian rate of firearm redacted has dropped without evidence of a similar reduction in the rate of firearm ownership. This means that according to both Justice Canada and our independent analysis, Based on the last 50 years in Canada, there is no indication to even remotely suggest that this issue can be at all helped by banning firearms or by enacting additional firearms legislation. This is information which has been well known by the government for nearly 30 years now. Which, again, if I can find this information out rather easily, surely Trudeau and the Liberals know of it as well. The presence of hand, a handgun in a home increases the likelihood of self harm Keeping each other safe from gun violence means keeping women, children, and families safe, and it prevents self-harm. So it's another baseless lie they tell intentionally in order to perpetuate their gun control agenda. And the last of their claims, which is harm prevention, is pretty straightforward. Do more guns actually mean more harm from guns? And more specifically here, this is going to be as it relates to accidental harm, since we've now covered every other possibility. And there actually isn't any good evidence to prove correlation or causation kind of one way or another as far as I can tell. Or, at the very least, I haven't been able to find any real evidence to this effect, and that's probably because the sample sizes are just so small. It's already a rather rare phenomenon in Canada. According to this study, it accounts for a little under 2% of all firearm-related deaths in Canada. However, even if this claim is true at scale in Canada, which is frankly quite questionable in and of itself, it isn't exactly a relevant claim. Like, this is not a phenomenon which is unique to firearm ownership. For example, let's say that it actually is true that owning a firearm increases your risk of accidentally incurring a firearm-related injury to some degree. However, it's also true that owning and driving a vehicle increases your risk of being in a car accident. Or having a backyard pool increases your risk of drowning at home. And going skydiving increases your risk of taking fall damage. There are inherent risks with all activities. So it makes no more sense to ban skydiving to protect the skydiver than it does to ban firearms to protect the firearms owner. The skydiver and the firearm owner both understand the risks associated with their activity. They both take sensible steps to mitigate those risks as much as reasonably possible. But to them, the activity is more beneficial than the risk. This kind of decision making is an inherent property of freedom. And that is something that the government, 
or anyone else has no business banning. If this claim were valid to be used as an excuse to violate your rights and freedoms, then that would give the government free reign to ban anything, anywhere, at any time that carries any risk, which is basically everything in the world to some extent. And from a constitutional perspective, this very narrow part of the gun control conversation should qualify as an inherently personal choice and therefore is protected behavior under Section 7's Liberty Clause. So, there you have it. As you can see, all of their primary claims regarding why we needed all of these enhanced gun control measures and bans are based on little more than fantasy. There is no statistical substantiation to what they're saying, and in fact the available empirical information overwhelmingly disproves their claims. Meaning that if they attempted to use any of these arguments in court to keep their faulty laws afloat, it would likely fail either the rational connection or the final balancing portions of the Oaks test. Now, it's all well and good to be satisfied about winning an argument, but at the end of the day, these aren't just stats. There are real people at the other end of these numbers, and that's why it's so critically important to get this right. Trudeau's insistence on blaming people and things that have nothing to do with the problems at hand is not only morally wrong, but it detracts from the very real and tangible things we could actually do to help. Even if we forget the injustice of this behavior itself, blaming us causes far more harm than it actually solves even from a purely public safety perspective. Governments being allowed to play the blame game to win political favor while people's safety is at stake is far more dangerous to Canada than our tiny minority group could ever be. And if we do consider the injustice of this behavior, it's clearly discrimination bordering on hate speech in my opinion. Now, I don't mean hate speech in the way that modern victim culture likes to use it. I mean the legal definition of hate speech as it's detailed by the Supreme Court in the court case of Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission versus what caught in 2013. And I plan on making a video discussing that in the near future. So get subscribed and stay tuned if you want to hear more about that. So I'd like to thank you all for watching. What do you think? Are you surprised at just how low some of these stats are? Or did you already know a lot of this beforehand? And how would you go about debunking these claims? Let me know in the comments down below, and while you're still here, perhaps considering checking out one of these other videos before you go. All that being said, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.